Welcome to another episode of the Capital Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Beardsley, and this morning we have J.P. Conklin from Petsford. Welcome. How you doing? I'm doing excellent. How are you? Just living the dream. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, to get started, we've got an exciting announcement this morning from the Fed. Um, you want to walk us through your take on it? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Jay Powell speaking virtually at the Jackson Hole Summit, which i um, still devastated. Another year has gone by where I was not invited. Um, but he came out and said that they are shifting their target inflation. So, for, for anybody who's been in the industry for a while, we all just know that 2% has always been the Fed's target inflation level. And what they're saying now is we're really going to be targeting averaging 2%. Um, and so if we are at 0% for a year, then we get to 2%. We really need to get to 4% on the far side in order to sort of average 2% over that time. And so the takeaway from the market's perspective is, the Fed is going to keep interest rates low for longer. And I think that the market probably was expecting the Fed would not be hiking for three to five years. This probably more likely suggests five, seven, and on the long end, maybe as long as 10 years. Wow, that's a big shift. I think, that, I mean, do you think the market responds well to this or do you think that causes fear of inflation and that once inflation hits, it's hard to stave off and, and it'll cause bigger issues? Yeah, that's a great question. We get that question a lot. I would say that the Fed would love to have an inflation problem right now or anytime soon. Um, we will not have an inflation problem anytime soon. If you go back after the financial crisis, only two quarters separately did we ever even breach 2% inflation over a 10 year window. And that was with all sorts of massive accommodation and with a relatively healthy economy otherwise. We just could not spur inflation. And so I think that the market will respond very favorably to this news. Um, I think stocks will probably go up. I think the yield curve steepens. This, this is basically a risk on move for the market because the Fed will not appear to be the one that's going to sort of cripple the recovery. They're gonna stay on the sideline and be as accommodative as possible for as long as any of, of us can really envision. And we will deal with inflation if it ever arises at some point down the road. And I think what the, the Fed keeps in their back pocket when it comes to inflation is they can cut off inflation pretty quickly. If they need to, they can start hiking interest rates aggressively and they can cut it off. What they struggle with is encouraging inflation and what they're trying to avoid at all costs is deflation. So I think we will be dealing with inflation at some point, five plus years from now, but not anytime soon. And it is the least of their worries right now. Definitely in the immediate term, I, I completely agree. What about the U.S.'s status as the world's reserve currency? Do you see, to me, that seems like the only issue with our ability to really avoid inflation. As long as that's true, we can avoid inflation. Do you see any issues with that as you look around the world? I think that you're right, that that would be probably the biggest risk to that. But it just seems unlikely to me that in the next three to five years that we will suddenly stop becoming the world's reserve currency. Um, I think that sort of transition takes a much longer period of time. And as you look around the world, we are still the world's biggest economy. And that's not going to change over the next couple of years. And central banks, foreign central banks, still view us as the world's mattress. And as long as that's the case, we will continue to be the reserve currency. And I don't think that that's going to change, uh, even in the face of this pandemic, because everybody is suffering. The United States, just as it has in previous downturns, is probably the best poise for recovery. And that downturn will be less felt here than some other countries. I think emerging markets could be feeling the pain for a decade plus. Um, and so we will just continue to look better relative to the alternatives for the foreseeable future. Definitely makes sense. So do you have a take on, because of this new Fed announcement, these new policies, do you have a take on where cap rates and commercial real estate are heading? Yeah, I think that this is nothing but positive news. Um, just like we saw post-financial crisis, Real estate borrowers can do well as long as interest rates are low. And 
you can underwrite a lot of delinquencies uh, and you can underwrite a lot of struggling tenants when you can borrow at basically 0% interest rates. So my suspicion is we will continue to have issues over the next 12 to 18 months because it's challenging to underwrite a deal. You don't really know who is paying rent because they have PPP money. Um, and that's still going to have to work itself through the system. So my suspicion is we probably have a flat to, you know, steadily climbing um, transaction volume for the next 12 to 18 months. But the borrowers themselves are so much better capitalized than they were in, you know, during the financial crisis that I think we are poised for a much faster rebound, particularly now that the Fed is committed to keeping interest rates low for as long as they will, because clients can just underwrite basically 0% interest rates for the foreseeable future. And a lot of deals work when that's your underwriting rate. Right. Pretty makes pretty much makes your, you know, live or curve analysis a no brainer. Exactly. <laughs> so, do you have any good news for distressed investors? I have been surprised that there haven't been more opportunities for distressed investors. Um, it seems to me that maybe a lot of firms currently came into this downturn pretty well capitalized and their position to weather the storm. Whereas we worked with a lot of distressed investors, sort of 2010-ish, 2011-ish, who were able to buy things for pennies on the dollar. And we have not seen that this time around, is that anybody who is in a position where they were thinking about selling has probably pulled back. Um, or if they are selling, it's not for as steep of a discount as I would have expected going into this downturn, knowing what we know about how sharp the uh, GDP contracted. So I, I think distressed investors from afar, this is not my specialty, but from afar, are probably struggling to find those deals. And just like a lot of people right now, it's just gonna require more work in order to get that deal across the finish line and to even find it. Right. So one of the things you mentioned early on was the steepening of the yield curve, which was definitely a topic for today. What is, so we've been in a very flat yield curve environment for the last while as we were at the top of the cycle. And today it still feels like we're to me at least, that we're still at a top of a cycle. It doesn't seem like we really have done a, a reset and found a new floor and have begun climbing, but the steepening of the yield curve potentially indicates something different. So what does uh, the steepened yield curve say about the market today? And, and you know, what are the risks of another inversion? Yeah, great question. And, and I think that you've touched on something there that it might be steepening, but it's still pretty flat relative to where it has been historically. So typically the measure of yield curve steepness is the difference between the two-year treasury and the 10-year treasury. And so today it's around 55 basis points, whereas historically it's more like a point and a half, two points. So we are still very flat, relatively speaking. Um, this is, should signal relative optimism and health over the long term, not for the near term, but over the long term. And I think what it's really suggesting is the stage is set for there eventually to be a recovery. Um, when you see the 10 year treasury start to climb, it suggests that the market is willing to start taking a little bit more risk and that there is some optimism about growth and inflation at some level over a 10 year period of time. So I think the fact that we're seeing it steep into 55 basis points, whereas it had been basically zero a year ago is a healthy signal. The concern about the inversion, I think, is probably going to be largely driven by what does this next phase of COVID-19 look like? If we can't really establish some sort of escape velocity where the economy can, can say we can live with some sort of moderate level of restrictions and we can maybe not be as profitable as we had been, but still be a viable business going forward, I think that the yield curve will stay at its current shape. If, however, we find that there's a huge second wave or that there's another um, mutation and things just start shutting down again, we just can't get out of it. I think at some point the, it'll wear on the psyche of investors and they'll say, you know what, I'm just sticking my money under the mattress. Let me know when there's a vaccine and I'll come out to play. Right. So, it's, you know, an inversion is definitely going to be driven by 
the long end of the curve if it does happen. 100%, because we, we know Fed policy dictates the front end of the curve, and they're on record, especially after today, of saying we're not hiking for probably three to five years. So that's not going anywhere. That means that the 10-year Treasury would have to get below 15 basis points. Basically, it'd have to be testing zero for us to have another inversion. Um, and I think where we stand today, that seems unlikely to me. Yeah, no, I agree. So going back to commercial real estate, you know, today borrowers have the choice to decide between fixed versus floating. And what, let's talk about uh, today first, and then we can broaden it to just a general fixed versus floating you know, discussion. But just for today, where would you encourage borrowers to, to go? The, the first question I always put back to the borrower who asked me that is, what is your hold period? Because that is really the biggest determining factor for me. If you tell me I'm holding this for 10 years, no matter what, I'm not going to refinance, I'm not going to sell. It's hard to argue against locking in at current levels, particularly if you don't have an onerous floor in the fixed rate. If you, however, say, listen, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. Maybe I want to reposition it and refinance a couple years from now when, when things are better, or I just want to keep my options open. You have very low risk of floating rates jumping on you in the next five years. And if they do, it's going to be such a small number that you're probably able to tolerate it. So the first thing that a borrower has to think about is how long am I going to be in this loan? That in turn decides whether I pick fixed or floating. Um, if the yield curve continues to steepen, that brings in the second component of that discussion, which is interest savings. Is it worth paying an additional premium for that fixed rate to have that sort of protection over a longer period of time? Right now, because the yield curve is so flat, that's not factoring into anyone's decision. But if you have not used floating rates before, you're going to have as low risk as you'll ever have if you start using them now because it's probably not moving up on you anytime soon. Nice. So something that I find really interesting in the fixed versus floating dynamic is looking at the way that they interact with each other in a rising rate environment as well as a falling rate environment. You know, I, I know you've talked about how in a rising rate environment, a lot of people are running to the fix and saying, you need to fix now before it's too late. And in the falling rate environment, an interesting dynamic occurs where fixed becomes cheaper than floating um, in the short term, but then as it continues to fall, the floater ends up being better. So it, um, talk about in a rising rate environment, what happens to both LIBOR and the 10 year and how that, um, in, you know, how that determines fixed versus floating its attractiveness. Yeah, so I'll start first by saying that when, you can lock in below the floating rate and it starts to feel like a no brainer is usually the worst time to lock in because the market is saying floating rates are going to be going down. Just be patient and you'll be able to ride them down. And so we had that discussion a lot with borrowers over the last couple of years saying, listen, maybe this time is different. I don't know. I, I'm not great at forecasting stuff, but every other time the yield curve is inverted, floating rates ended up going down significantly and you were better off floating. Conversely, the best time to fix is really right before the Fed starts hiking. Because if you lock in too far in advance, you pay this premium and you jump up to a higher rate well in advance of them actually hiking. And so it ends up costing you money and you didn't really get the protection because they stayed low with floating. And if you can time it, which nobody can really time it well, but if you're patient, Really, the best time to lock in traditionally is right before they start hiking because the market tends to underestimate how much they will end up hiking. And so if you lock in, if they start sending the signal that, hey, in 2025, we're going to be hiking interest rates, in all probability, the best time to lock in is probably right before then. Got it. And the other complication with floating is the lender's requirement of buying a rate cap. So you want to quickly go through uh, a rate cap, and then we can discuss rate cap strategies. Sure. So uh, an interest rate cap is nothing more than buying an insurance contract. You just want to make sure that your floating rate, usually LIBOR, doesn't get above a certain strike. And frequently lenders will require that a, 
borrower buy that as part of the closing because they just want to know that there is some maximum interest rate that they can underwrite to and feel comfortable that they're going to get paid. So it's a totally reasonable requirement and they're incredibly cheap right now because the cost of an interest rate cap is dictated primarily by expectations for where rates are going. So just like in 2012, when the Fed came out and said, we're not hiking for the next three years, what we're seeing now is there's no threat of the Fed hiking for the next three years, and those caps almost become free. There's basically no market value to them. It's really just paying the bank for the cost of selling an insurance contract. And so they end up costing, you know, 10 grand, 12 grand. And it's a really easy way to just get the loan that you need, satisfy the lender requirement, and know that this rate can't get away from me over the next three years in case something crazy happens. So I guess the interesting discussion really becomes at what duration and at what strike do you buy your cap? Because obviously the lender's going to have their requirements for those things, but the borrower theoretically could take it upon themselves and be more aggressive with both the duration and the strike. So what's the rationale for, for both of those? Yeah, great question. And this has come up a lot in the last six months. We've had a lot of clients come in and opportunistically hedge more aggressively just because of the dynamic that you're describing. And so essentially it boils down to this cost is so low right now that I'm going to use this as an opportunity to hedge for longer or at a lower strike. And so normally the primary drivers of an interest rate cap cost are term and strike. I normally buy a three year cap, but you know what? I'm not sure I'll be out of this loan in three years. And I don't want to have to pay for an interest rate cap in years four or five with an unknown premium. So let me just go ahead and pay an extra five grand, 10 grand and be done with it. Um, or they say, you know what? The lender's requiring a strike on LIBOR at 2%, but I don't think it's getting to 2%. So that's just throwing money away. Let me instead buy a strike at 50 basis points or 75 basis points and just protect myself. And I can go back to my investors and say, our rate cannot exceed X for the next three to five years because we took advantage of this and bought a much lower strike cap. Um, we've seen cap prices come down um, by almost 100% over the last 12 to 18 months. So we've done a lot of analysis for clients where a cap that they're considering today might have cost 200 grand a year ago. Today, it might cost 20 grand. It's just crazy how cheap interest rate caps have become. And so for borrowers who are comfortable with floating and then just want the ability to sleep at night, interest rate caps make all the sense in the world. And so what if I'm a borrower and I think, yeah, of course rates are gonna stay at zero for the next three years, but I'm really worried about rising inflation in year four and five, and I want to protect myself then. Is there a way to create a structured product for you know, having, let's say, well, you know, have a 2% strike in years one through three, but then have a 50 bip strike in four and five or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. You can structure a cap any way that you see fit, particularly to fit your business model. The scenario you're describing would essentially boil down to, do I expect to have a certain amount of floating rate debt outstanding four or five, six years from now? And at what rate do I want to hedge that? You can set the strike between now and let's say year four at wherever you want, it's largely irrelevant. So setting at 1% or 2% probably doesn't change the cost. All the value is wrapped up in years four and five in that scenario. So you can customize that strategy to match whatever underwriting metric you're trying to achieve. But I would also say that is primarily for the floating rate bars. If you are a fixed rate bar or you have a lot of debt maturing in 2023, 20, 24, 25, the Fed does not control the 10-year treasury nearly as effectively as it controls LIBOR. So we have a lot of bars who come and they price swaptions. And that's a funky word. It's just the word swap and the word option pushed together. You know, this industry is super creative. It's just a call option on long-term fixed rates. And so they may say, listen, I don't want the 10-year treasury to be above 1.5% in 2023. I have $100 million that I expect to be pricing on some sort of fixed rate basis. I just want to hedge against the 10-year treasury being above, let's say, 150. They take the risk of 
the 10 year treasury between here and 150, anything above there, they get compensated. And it basically buys their rate back down to 150. And just like with a cap, they just pay an upfront premium for that and they never owe any more money. So it's not like they have to worry about a swap breakage where it might be against them a couple million bucks. Whatever you pay up front for it is your worst case scenario. And if you get out in 2023 and it's below 150, the option expires worthless. If it's above 150, you exercise and the hedge provider pays you the present value difference and it effectively buys you back down to 150. And this is for a refi scenario for a fixed borrower? Absolutely. Or if they just know that they have some amount of debt that they would expect. So we've got some borrowers who say, you know what, we know that each year we're constantly rolling two to 300 million bucks a year. We just want to hedge some portion of that. Maybe we just want to hedge 100 million each year for the next, you know, three plus years, just helping themselves sleep at night. And it's a story that they can tell to their investors that, Hey, we're mitigating that risk and we're taking advantage of the current rate environment to make sure that we protect your returns. Right. So on the, for, for interest rate caps, where, at what point, you know, year five, six, seven, all the way to 10, at what point does the, the market or the product get inefficient or illiquid and, and not really make sense to, cause if I'm, let's say I'm a floating rate borrower, but I want to protect myself for the full 10 year loan term. Does that make sense to do? It certainly can. We've sold a lot more 10 year caps this year than we ever have before, just because it is, it has been primarily a cash issue in the past. The cost goes up exponentially with each additional year. It is so much cheaper today than it's ever been that some people are saying, you know what, I can stomach that number and I can just put this to bed for 10 years. I think what we more commonly see for somebody who's trying to hedge 10 years is a swap where they would just come in and execute a swap on that, convert to a fix for 10 years, and not have to pay the upfront premium that goes along with it. But the market is certainly liquid out to 10 years plus, and you can get an aggressive quote. It's just a matter of, do you want to pay the cash out of pocket that's required to buy a 10-year instrument? Right. Because otherwise, then, if you buy a three-year cap, let's say, you're forcing your four to buy a cap again, subject to market conditions, and then you know, year eight, I suppose you'd be, you'd buy a two year cap again um, and be continually subject to market conditions at those times. Correct. Absolutely. Now we, we have a lot of borrowers who run analysis with us where they plan on doing what is essentially a rolling cap purchase strategy, just like you're describing, because they'll say, okay, if I want to buy, let's say five years today, let me compare the cost of a five year versus the cost of a 10 year. And whatever amount I save, let me just stick it into an escrow account and just sort of set it aside for that future cap purchase. And at some point between now and month 60, I'll execute. It do, they don't have to wait until month 60. Three years in, if things start feeling different, they can start investigating options. But they use that to justify why it might make sense doing something shorter term with the intent of buying it again in the future because they don't want to overpay for term premium. Each in incremental year costs more and more and more. And they're like, you know what? Let's start with five years and then I'm just going to keep an eye on it, monitor it, and I'll buy it again before the first one expires. Got it. You mentioned swaps as well. It's, it's something that we don't really come across too much in the multifamily space. So where do you see swaps used most prevalently? Basically every other asset class where a borrower is, is working with a traditional lender so all the big banks that you can think of, and then much more recently, the regional banks have gotten into the space. Um, any sort of balance sheet loan. If, if it's over a couple million dollars, banks are going to try to encourage borrowers to use a swap to fix the interest rate. <clears throat> Excuse me, the reason being, it's a fee revenue event for the bank. So banks can create a lot of additional revenue for themselves by selling the swap. From the borrower's perspective, they get a fixed rate. It's easy, they understand it. From the bank's perspective, they provide a fixed rate, but they also make a lot more money in the process. Interesting. So another thing you mentioned were, were LIBOR floors and you know these pesky LIBOR floors. So what do you make of bridge lenders today having floors at 1% even though LIBOR is at you know, 15, 16 bips? I think that borrowers should just treat that like a higher loan spread. 
that LIBOR is not going up anytime soon. Let's just round up and call it 20 basis points for the next five years. If someone is quoting you a 1% floor, you should just assume that your loan spread is 80 basis points higher because it effectively is. Don't treat it like something that's going to disappear in the next three to five years, especially after today's Fed announcement. You are basically adding on top of your loan spread in that instance, which is totally fair. I understand why lenders do it. I think that it becomes almost like a shell game of I'm charging you an aggressive loan spread. And oh, by the way, there's this floor when in reality, it's like, no, the floor kind of is just increasing your loan spread. If it was 250 before, now it's 330. Treated like a, a term sheet you, you got for LIBOR plus 330, not LIBOR plus 250 and a 1% floor. Right. So you think it's more, more just a marketing tactic than anything else? Yes. And I understand why they have to protect their margin. So I'm not even opposed to them doing that. But it's, it is the equivalent of quoting somebody LIBOR plus 330 in that example. And let's just call it what it is. Right. Right. And so is there a possibility that LIBOR goes negative? There's always that possibility. I don't think it's likely. Um, one of the other things the Fed mentioned today was that they will not be taking Fed funds negative. Now, they can always change their mind. They're terrible at forecasting downside scenarios, so this could change. But for the time being, we have a Fed chair with a unanimous Fed agreement that they will not be taking Fed funds and therefore LIBOR negative. Um, so I think we have to take them at their word and say it's probably not going to happen here. Even if it did, it's probably something like negative 10 basis points. It's not going to be what we're seeing in Switzerland, you know, negative 60 basis points. Uh, but I don't think that's likely. I think we're probably going to see LIBOR stay between 15 and 20 basis points for the next five plus years. Got it. So, and speaking of LIBOR, what about the transition to SOFR and how has coronavirus affected that? It hasn't slowed the agencies down as much as I would have expected. The agencies have really taken the lead on this, um, which makes sense because they're coordinating with the regulators and the regulators want this transition to a market-driven index, um, all of which is very well intended. Um, I give the regulators a lot of credit for being very deliberate and thoughtful about how they were gonna make this transition occur. Because most people don't realize they've really been working on this for about seven years now. This is, we started hearing about it a couple of years ago, but they've really been at work at, at this for hard for over seven years. Um, and so they're leaning on the agencies to say, help us spur this change over to SOFR. And so you're starting to see in the multi-space SOFR term sheets. Um, and Freddie having conference calls with brokerage houses to say, we want you to encourage your borrowers to buy SOFR caps uh, on SOFR financing and let's help lead this transition from LIBOR to SOFR. We have not seen that take place anywhere else yet, um, nor have we seen a pickup in SOFR trading volume. It is still mostly non-existent. So I have a feeling that this is going to in involve some growing pains over the next probably you know six to 12 months. That's interesting. And it sounds like you probably are going to have to, the agencies potentially could and will subsidize uh, the encouragement of the transition via lower spreads. You know, they'll entice borrowers with lower spreads if they choose SOFR index over LIBOR. We're waiting to see if that's the case. We had heard from a couple of borrowers that they were speaking to their brokers and who were referencing that. Um, I have not seen a term sheet where Freddie quoted um, a lower loan spread if you chose SOFR or higher leverage if you chose SOFR. So I don't know that they're definitely going to do that. Um, I think for now, their, their primary tactic is just encouraging their partners to say, listen, one way or another, this is happening. On Jan 1, we are out of the LIBOR origination business. We might as well start taking the Band-Aid off now. Um, and so I know that they've been working really hard with cap providers to make sure that cap providers can also provide caps. Um, I've been skeptical at, at a hedge provider's ability to provide a SOFR cap um, just because the market is so illiquid. And so that when the market's illiquid, that just tells me our borrowers pay more. Um, we're seeing premiums for SOFR caps 50% to 100%, depending on the structure. Um, 
but banks are starting to get to a point where they are willing to at least quote so for caps, even though nobody has closed one yet on, you know, an agency transaction for multi-deal. Yeah. Yeah. We, we asked Freddie and uh, for a cheaper <laughs> spread over so far, they said no. <laughs> so JP, we didn't really have a chance to fully introduce yourself at the beginning. Um, and not, we haven't really talked about uh, loan boss or Pensford. So why don't you, you know, take a step back, go, go through about, you know, yourself, about your companies and, and share whatever you are looking to share. Sure. So we've worked together um, on the Pensford side I founded Pensford back in 2009 I spent my career working in interest rate derivatives, primarily with commercial real estate firms. And so we are just an interest rate advisory firm. And primarily we pay the bills through working with our borrowers on interest rate strategies, selling caps, um, negotiating swaps with lenders, things of that nature. Uh, and then last year we launched a software company designed specifically for the debt component of commercial real estate operations. It just seemed like there were so many options when it came to um, accounting or property management or lease management or investor distribution. And there was this really large gap in the market that would address just the debt component of real estate, which as everybody who is listening knows is an enormously important aspect. And I think part of the reason for that is that it's a pretty complex part of the transaction and it's constantly changing. And so we always have to update like cash flows or go get a new forward curve or what does the market say, you know, 10 year treasury is going to be three years from now. If I'm looking at an arm, loan boss puts all that into one place so that bars don't have to run those calculations anymore. And it centralizes and streamlines everything, whether it's a calculation or a cash flow or the documents in one warehouse so that you can access it instantly from your computer and have the numbers at your fingertips uh, rather than starting from scratch over and over and over again. And so, for example, the most commonly used feature of Loan Boss is the fact that prepayment calculations, whether it's defeasance or yield maintenance, spread maintenance, any of that stuff, it's automatically calculated for you constantly and it's always live. So you don't have to go online to a calculator like Pensford's defeasance calculator and build it from scratch every month. You just have it. And if you're like, hey, I'm 90 days out from our closing, or I want to see what my prepayment penalties look like at year end, all you do is click a button, change the date, and it tells you, here's what the market is projecting your prepayment penalty to be, 1231. I just feel like there was this huge opportunity for us to make this part of real estate catch up to the rest of the industry. And so we've had some pretty explosive growth over the last year. We just launched about a year ago. Um, and really excited about the opportunities of where we're headed with this. Yeah, congrats on that. That sounds really exciting. So to uh, to wrap it up, let uh, you know let listeners know where to go to learn more about Pensford. Um, you know, sign up for the newsletter, um, learn more about Loan Boss. Yeah, absolutely. So Pensford is just Pensford.com. Uh, I put out a weekly newsletter Monday mornings. Just my thoughts on interest rate markets in general. Um, and then I'll highlight if I think like a swaption might make sense. Usually just my take on what, what data has come out. It'd be things like the, the Fed meeting this week, what might be on the horizon that we need to pay attention to and sort of what risks that we should be cognizant of. Uh, and then Loan Boss is just simply loanboss.com as well. And you can go there and you can see a demo and you can see videos on uh, some of the functionality that goes along with it. So I appreciate you having me on. It's always great talking to you. Yeah, good deal. Pleasure having you on. Really appreciate your time. Um, look forward to speaking with you soon. Absolutely. Thank you, man.